I'm just kidding. I'm not actually a Yoma, and these aren't innards. This is just great fruit and fake blood, okay? So, Claire, you can put your claymore back. I'm a human. If you kill me, you get in trouble, okay? So why don't you just put your claymore back and wait? Oh, okay, 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 okay. Hold on a second. I'm just a guy that compares manga to anime, okay? I'm not a Yoma, okay? I know what this looks like. And you know what? It's a prank, okay? It's a prank, okay? Don't don't worry about it, man. You, okay, wait, don't do I didn't even get to do Dragon Balls. Not a hero Yagi's Claymore. A series you just kind of stumble on and thank the anime gods for tripping you. This wasn't on Adult Swim, this wasn't on Toonami, and this probably wasn't on your radar. Shit, I can't even remember how I started watching this. I think it was just a random choice on a boring ass day. And that was probably the anime I recommend most to people. You know how when you meet somebody that watches anime as much as you do, and then you guys both start naming off anime to see which ones you've watched? Every time I name Claymore, nobody's seen it, and it makes me cry a little bit inside. So if y'all don't know, let me get you acquainted. I describe Claymore as bleach mixed with berserk. You got intense action scenes coupled with raw, emotional, and jaw-dropping moments. Character development brilliantly mixed in with a vast and unique cast. Oh, and sweet, sweet entrails. Ah. Bury my face in the warmth of wet, bloody entrails. And Claymore should be famous for having one of the biggest yeet moments in anime and manga history. Well pick your jaw up off the floor, cause I'm not here to do a review or gush about one of my favorite series. Unfortunately, the anime of Claymore left fans with a very shitty taste in their mouth. Actually, that's not shit. that's actually Yoma flesh. I guess human entrails really do taste better. We were also left with questions like what the hell is up with this weird ass organization that assigns claymores to kill Yoma? And what are Yoma? And what do claymores look like naked? The manga's gotta answer these questions. Why is the last battle so unfulfilling and dry? The manga's last battle has to be more epic, doesn't it? The story can't be over yet. Well, it's not. And that's where I come in. Welcome to Breaking Jokes, people. We are back and ready to close another chapter in the book titled Manga vs. Anime. If you don't like to read manga, it's okay, I got your back. Anime usually is worse. I disagree, but I'll let you know what's up. So come, join the Breaking Tropes family. It's safe here. I promise I'm not a Yoma. I won't eat your entrails. I will ask you humbly to like, sub, and talk that talk in the comment section below. Now, while you watch the rest of this video, I'm going to eat the rest of these entrails. I, I, I mean, taffy. It's just taffy, guys. The categories we use to judge both the anime and the manga will be length and pacing, presentation, story, characters and themes. Oh, and one more thing, beware of the spoiler stop sign. If you see this before a section, there are spoilers. You can't say I didn't warn ya. Produced through Madhouse, the anime was directed by Hiroyuki Tanaka, who's known for his work on Ninja Scroll and Attack on Titan. The seasoned Yasuko Kobayashi handled series composition and some screenwriting duties as well. Spanning 26 episodes and airing April 4th through September 26th of 2007, the anime was wrapped up in roughly 6 months. The manga on the other hand spanned 27 volumes equaling 155 chapters, spanning from June 2001 through October 2014. Unfortunately, this meant that the anime could only adapt part of the first 11 volumes, or 61 chapters to be more precise. Seeing that volume 12 was released during the same month as the anime's debut, it's easy to tell that Clamor met the common issue of the anime outpacing the manga. Yeah, Japan was like f**k seasons back then. So where does all this leave us on the congruence rating? Well, let's take a look at the calculation methods. If we're looking at how accurately the anime covers the manga, Claymore scores high. 23 of the 26 episodes directly cover manga content, so we have a score of 88%, which is pretty good. Now let's look at the amount of content the anime covers. Exactly 61 chapters of content are covered in the anime, so 61 out of a total of 155 chapters gives us a score of 40%. This is a pretty bad score, and that's not even including the bonus chapters either. So from looking at this, it's easy to tell that the anime serves as an accurate but short representation of the manga. When we combine both scores, we get an average of 65%, so let's stick with that and move on.
The anime is fast paced which makes it a joy to watch. Each episode is meaningful to the plot and transitions between plot lines are seamless. How many series can pull off a hard cut flashback to a brand new character without pissing off the audience? Well Claymore does just that and we are all better for it. It's uncommon for an anime to keep the same pace as its manga counterpart, especially if we're talking about an action heavy series, but Claymore succeeds in doing this. Unfortunately, the anime's conclusion is bogged down with large amounts of micro flashbacks and stalling. This might not be something you notice initially, but trust me when I say it might be very annoying to some people. Now as far as length goes, the anime would have benefited from an extra maybe 30 to 50 episodes. And you can see this just from looking at the congruence rating we talked about earlier. The anime of Claymore should have been longer, and that is a noted key difference. These are the emblems of the top five. I mean, we don't even get to see the current number one warrior of the organization, Alicia. Well, gonna have to wait for the manga story section for that one. You could tell that Claymore was designed with a clear aesthetic in mind, which is always a great launching point for a solid anime. Dull backdrops, lighting, and colors were intentional features that add a grimness to the mood. This is a medieval world full of carnivorous man-eaters in disguise, and you feel that from the jump. When asked what the production team paid close attention to, Tanaka stated, あの、あんまりこうパキパキした。こう、セルですっていうような色味にはまずしたくなかったし、背景にしてもえ、よくあるような街にポンと収めてしまうっていうのはちょっとしたくないね。なんで冒頭の頭の方は特にあのみんなと
It's in these episodes where the characters in the world of Claymore really start to shine. However, differences from the manga start to mount around episode 20, which leads to a very abrupt and frustrating conclusion. If your life really means that little to you, I wish I'd never gone to the trouble of saving you. The main plot points include Claire being saved by the number two ranked warrior of Teresa's time, Quicksword Elena. Claire's encounter with the abyssal creature Riffle of the West, involving the number three and nine ranked warriors Galatea and Jean. A suicide mission issued by the organization in the Northern Territory Pieta, involving 24 Claymore. And finally, the last battle, Clara vs. Priscilla. The anime story is amazing up until episode 24. And that's when we start to see a sharp turn from the manga storyline. The ending of the anime hints at a potential season 2. Though I can't say when, we'll meet again. Lying. Did this ever happen? The audience is left to wonder. The anime also leaves out details regarding the organization, Yoma, Awakened Beings, Abyssal Creatures, New Claymore, Locations, Weaponry, Experimentation, and the world in its entirety. Obviously, this hurts the anime greatly, but it still does a wonderful job with the content that it had at the time. Claire. She is motivated by one day killing Priscilla and avenging Teresa. Yet during the battle in Pieta, she is convinced by Rocky not to kill her because revenge is bad. Yeah, so you decide to stuff demon flesh inside you so you're strong enough to kill your guardian's killer. And years later, you finally get the chance, but then you just say fuck it at the last moment. Makes sense to me. Strength-wise, her half-awakened form is enough to beat Priscilla, which doesn't make a lick of sense. And then you realize she didn't even awaken her arms to defeat Rigaldo. So basically, this Claire is by far the strongest being in the anime. Claire's cold, calculated exterior remains the same throughout the anime. Rocky. He immediately starts traveling with Claire and remains weak and scrawny. Well, I guess he's just a human boy after all. It's not like he could kill a Yoma. Oh. Anyways, he doesn't stay very long with Eastley, opting to instead go towards Pieta to find Claire. After the final battle, he continues his travels with her. Teresa of the Faint Smile. One of the strongest claymores ever created. After the four flashback episodes covering her story, she's basically an afterthought. Priscilla. The main antagonist of Claymore and the strongest of the awakened beings. Although it might not seem like it based on how the anime ended, her backstory and the reason she is so strong are unknown. Although we do get some small flashbacks of her past during the last few episodes, we learn that she's basically super confused. She thinks Claire is Teresa, she thinks Teresa killed her parents, so yeah, she's kind of a mess here. The Asunder Group so I define this group as the original three Claymore who go on Claire's first awakened being hunt. They can surpass their Yoma limits without awakening and are probably the most important characters in Claymore aside from the ones I just mentioned. We have the leader of number 6 ranked Phantom Media, the number 15 ranked Deneva, and the 22nd ranked Helen. They all decided to investigate the organization after the end of the anime. And speaking of the organization, we really don't get anything with them at all. Rubel is kind of a mysterious character with an unknown objective, and the organization's leader is only seen during one scene, so they're pretty much non-existent. This is one of those anime where you don't get to see some of the themes come full circle because the product is incomplete. Companionship and trauma are important throughout the series, so let's touch on those now. Then later on in the manga section, you can see how they come full circle. Companionship can be seen through Claire and Rocky's relationship, which is a complete restoration of Claire and Teresa's. It's Rocky who gives Claire a reason to survive and not give in to her Yoma self, just like Claire gave an apathetic Teresa happiness and a reason to live. Relationships like these and the resulting compassion pulled from them are what fuel not just Claire, but all the Claymores throughout the anime. You are among friends here. Anything you can't do alone will be right there to help you with. And you really can't think about Claymore warriors without looking at their traumatic pasts. We have everything from witnessing a loved one being eaten in front of you to slaughtering one that has become a Yoma. The show doesn't shy away from the impact this has on the characters. In fact, how each Claymore reacted to their trauma directly dictates whether they are an offensive or defensive type. And that's pretty damn cool, but the manga adds even more to this as you will see later. Claymore has quite the serialization history. The manga debuted in 2001 and was serialized through Monthly Jump, the sister magazine to the famous Weekly Jump. However, slumping sales caused the Monthly Jump magazine to die, which forced Claymore to migrate over to Weekly Jump for a short four chapter period during 2007. It wouldn't be surprising if Claymore's fan base increased during this time, due to the anime running and Weekly Jump being a staple for all manga lovers. Regardless, it was a nice coincidence for Yagi. In November of the same year, Claymore debuted in Jump Square, a monthly publication that replaced the failed Monthly Jump. Yagi finished the series seven years later. I think it's important to note that throughout all this, Yagi kept his monthly schedule, even during Claymore's run in Weekly Jump. 
I suspect this could be the reason why the series isn't so widely known. Claymore had a lot going against it, a monthly schedule combined with a 13 year run and an anime that didn't last very long. These are things that are tough for any series to overcome. Spanning 27 volumes and 155 chapters, Yaki successfully finishes his narrative the way it was intended, all while executing a 7 year time skip, introducing the next generation of Claymore and resolving the mysteries that plague the anime. The first 5 chapters of the manga are awkwardly paced, but are more detailed and faster than the anime. This is covered in the listed difference section, but I'll just say the order of events is not good compared to the anime. Aside from that, Claymore is paced well, especially during its peak but stumbles a bit during its latter third. Just like the anime, fast action defines the first 61 chapters, but as the awakened beings grow stronger, battles become more prolonged and epic. This leads to some awkward pacing as characters seem to be teleporting at times. I would say Yagi kind of slacks on implementing clear transitions between scenes and battles during the last 50 chapters, but this is a very minor issue. Yagi takes the time to flush out most of the cast by switching perspectives more often after the time skip. These switches were a refreshing break from mostly following Claire and did wonders in illuminating the world. Claymore achieves the difficult task of telling a large story in a short amount of time. If I had the choice to make Claymore longer, I wouldn't. Simply put, 155 chapters is the perfect length, and this is because all loose ends are tied up, and we even get some very entertaining side chapters showing the past of Claire, Priscilla, Teresa, Ophelia, and more. One of my biggest gripes with Shonen is how they end, their endings mostly suck, let's be honest. Or their ending arcs suck, but not with Claymore. Objectives are met, promises are kept, and precautions are taken to protect the future. Yaki's art is straight out of a John Carpenter film. His interest in horror movies is easy to recognize just by looking at the plethora of awakened being designs. Speaking of which, it's the detail in these designs that make the awakened beings appear more menacing and diverse, especially when compared to their rather plain anime counterparts. Yaki applies a lot of screen tone and shading, clearly taking his time on each malformed monster. They were a joy to look at and another noted key difference. When it comes to humans and claymores, massive foreheads and far apart eyes are signatures of Yagi's style. I would say that his panels are a bit inconsistent from time to time, and he also has the tendency to leave out faces during action panels. But when Yaki puts his tryhard hat on, it's usually very impressive. Double page spreads are a sight to behold in Claymore, and just by looking at these, it's easy to tell that Yagi had a monthly release schedule. During action panels, motion is conveyed well. Yagi implements a wispy style, so movement is very easy to notice. Panels are logical and impactful moments pop. So yes, it took time for Yagi to finish Claymore, but unlike with some manga, it's easy to see why. For everyone wondering where to pick up the manga after finishing the anime, you're going to want to read from chapter 59. It picks up right when Claire awakens her legs. Some might say 60 or 61, but starting from here could cause confusion as some of the events in the manga are different. So you might as well start at chapter 59 just to see how everything is supposed to happen. Now, this is the part of the video where I nag all you anime watchers to read the manga. You obviously love the series if you're watching this video, so it'd be a shame for you to accept that weak ass ending in the anime. So what I'm going to go ahead and tell you to do is read the manga. Yeah, that's right, go read the manga right now. Stop watching this video. You can always come back later. Go! Oh, you're still here. I guess you can't be convinced. And if that's the case, let's get down to business. Overall, the battle in Pieta is much shorter in the manga. Gone are the lengthy flashbacks and annoying rocky scenes. Good riddance. After Clara awakens her limbs while fighting Regaldo, she cannot control her speed. However, she ends up awakening her left arm and using it to attack and improve her movement. Spikes emerge from her body in a rather horrifying panel and she ends up tearing Regaldo to shreds. Now in the anime, she just kills Regaldo by somehow gaining control of her speed and using the quick sword. She even allowed her legs to awaken and in a matter of minutes was able to learn to control them. She doesn't awaken any part of her upper body. Maybe the showrunners wanted to save this form for the final battle with Priscilla, but this is a rather sloppy decision since it seems like Claire just got stronger out of nowhere. After the battle, we have the sentimental scene where Jean sacrifices herself to bring Claire back from awakening. A sobbing Claire holds a deceased Jean, then Deneva kicks the shit out of Claire, reminding her that the battle is not over as they are still surrounded by awakened beings. And these are the same awakened beings that are called back by Easley in the anime. 
The Asunder group accompanied by number 40 Yuma, number 31 Tabitha, and number 14 Cynthia make their last stand. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Now back to the Jean scene. She doesn't take Claire's attack for Rocky, unlike in the anime, because he's not there. In fact, Rocky isn't even involved in the battle, and neither is Priscilla. Instead, we have an additional scene where Easley is training Rocky. This is happening at the same time, indoors and far away from the action. This scene ends with panels from the Pieta battle, and a naked Priscilla sensing the claymores dropping off one by one as tears flow from her eyes. Later on, the awakened beings move further from the north until they are utterly annihilated by the twins Alicia and Beth, the current number one and number two warriors in the organization's trump card. They are decked out in black armor and looking pretty badass. Galatea figures out that the two share one mind, so one can awaken while the other keeps the human soul intact. Elsewhere, the final creature of the abyss is revealed to be Lucila of the South, the older sister of Raphaela and the unfortunate result of the organization's first attempt at the Soul Link experiment, the same Soul Link experiment used with Alicia and Beth. Lucila and Easley go 1v1 for the North Territory, and Easley whips that ass. Lucila escapes into the woods and reunites with her sister for the first time since being human. She begs Raffaella for help, and then something very strange happens. This marks the end of the Pieta sequence, and as you can see, the story immediately starts setting up some important things. Did the Asunder group survive? What's up with the cool new Black Claymore? And did Rafaela put her twin sister out of her misery? Well, these questions would be answered after a seven year time skip. So let's outline the story from this point on. Volumes 11 through 13 take place after the time skip, and we find out that there are no survivors in the Battle of Pieta. We start from the perspective of Clarice, who is the new number 47 ranked warrior. She is the only Claymore to have colored hair and has a very low amount of Yoki energy. Ladies and gentlemen, f Claire introducing the new main character of Claymore. Ah, oh, wait, never mind, Claire is still alive, along with the rest of the Asunder group, and Yuma, Tabitha, and Cynthia. Let's call this group the North Group moving forward. So we find out that the North Group managed to hide their Yoki aura and get stronger over the past seven years. The Asunder group minus Claire end up saving Clarice and her group from awakened beings in the North, while Claire finds evidence that Rocky is alive. The North Group ultimately decides to hit South, so basically they are done hiding. During the group's travels, they barely manage to save a group of new Claymore from Riffle of the West. Claire gets information about the current power balance from Riffle and quickly escapes afterwards. Elsewhere, Clarice is tasked with monitoring the number 4 ranked Miata, a new, powerful yet mentally unstable child Claymore, who immediately views Clarice as her mother. The two head to Rabona to hunt down the missing Galatea using Miata's sixth sense ability. A quick side note here, there are some pretty cool extra chapters regarding a young Teresa and Media's past. Volumes 14 through 18 expand the world of Claymore and drop some huge bombshells. Clarice and Miata find Galatea who is serving as a nun and has gotten rid of her eyesight. Sister Latea, yeah, she changed her name. As Miata battles Galatea, an awakened being named Bloody Agatha emerges. The three battle and Miata continues to attack and maim Galatea, while Agatha weakens Miata. Obviously, this weird battle triangle is benefiting Agatha greatly, and all hope seems lost. That is, until the North group arrives and slays Agatha easily. Extra chapters include Priscilla's first meeting with Easley and Claire's early days training in the organization. Some pretty good stuff here. After the battle, Media drops a truth bomb on everyone by stating that the organization created Yoma and that the island is a testing ground for awakened beings. <gasps> oh my god. Going on further to explain that the continent they are on is just a small part of the world, a world that is at war involving two sides, the dominant side being allies with dragon descendants, and the dragon descendants remains being the baseline for Yoma and awakened beings. And because of the instability of the awakened beings, research was moved to the island in hopes to create the ultimate weapon to win the war. Ah yes, it all makes sense now, all Claymore are test subjects, even the Claymores they use are not of that island. But what would this mean for the story? Shortly after the meeting, the group splits. Claire, Cynthia, and Yuma go west to find Rocky, Helen and Deneva go south to visit her hometown, and the rest of the North group stays in Rabona, well at least until Media decides to go after the organization later on by herself. Elsewhere, we see an adult Rocky visiting his hometown with Priscilla. He kills a Yoma, yeah, he's that strong. Where did this man get steroids? I don't know. The two run into a claymore named Renee who was later captured by Riffle. Riffle attempts to force her to awaken a dormant statue thing of the twin sisters. Anyways, remember Raphael and Lucila? Good, well it turns out they're still alive. Sort of, if you call this being alive. I mean, what do you call this damn thing? I tried to think of a name for it. It's just like two motherfucking twins merged together or some shit. I don't know. In the West, Claire reunites with Rubo who states that he is a spy on the opposing side of the organization. 
He reveals that he concealed information on semi-awakened beings since they are the closest thing to what the organization desires, the Asunder group being semi-awakened beings. Also, he reveals that he told media everything about the organization. Rubo wants no evidence of semi-awakened beings, so his true intentions are to get the Asunder group killed. He tells Claire about Renee who was captured by Riffle and hopes that she'll go there and save her. Obviously, this puts her in danger, which is what he wants. Elsewhere, Deneva and Helen help a group of Claymore led by number 8 Dietrich, a next generation Claymore. Deneva and Helen sense Easley's presence and end up getting attacked by him. However, Abyssal Feeders, new creatures created by the organization, arrive and attack Easley, allowing Dietrich the chance to save them. The Feeders end up killing Easley, which is actually pretty sad. Poor guy just wanted a family. Okay, back to Claire. She finds Riffle's hideout and ends up being transported to the sister's remains, which awaken into a super powerful abyssal level creature. I guess they call this thing the Destroyer, and I think that's a pretty good name because it shoots out spike missiles that turn to awakened beings. The spikes spread throughout the island. One of the spikes hits Rocky, who is saved by Priscilla and taken by the organization. Then we have this big ass battle sequence between the following parties, Alicia, Beth, and Abyssal Feeders versus Dolph and Riffle versus Priscilla who arrives chasing Claire's scent. Then we have Claire, Helen, and Deneva versus the destroyer Spawn. And lastly, we have Yuma and Cynthia running away from everything. The battle ends with Priscilla murking pretty much everyone and breaking the destroyer's body, revealing an even more disturbing form. And I'm not exaggerating here. Priscilla murks so many people during this battle scene, I can't even fit it all on the screen. Helen and Deneva escape from Priscilla carrying an injured Claire. I think this is where the pacing issues start to show a little bit. Characters seem to be moving a little bit too fast and teleporting. Volumes 19 through 23 cover the Claymore's revolt against the organization. While Helen and Deneva escape, Claire is impaled and eaten by the destroyer who continues the battle with Priscilla. Media attacks the organization and defeats the entire Claymore force except the twin replacement trainees for Alicia and Beth. Oh yeah, Alicia and Beth. They got completely destroyed by Priscilla in the last battle. Let's get a moment of silence for the number one and number two ranked warriors. Back to the battle, the organization's last defense against the rogue Claymore is number 10 Raftella, who manipulates Medea's ore while the rest of the Claymore kill her. Psych, Medea is revealed to be alive. The new Claymore spared her due to her courage and compassion, deciding to follow her instead. The new Claymore force led by Medea is attacked by the organization's last line of defense, Abyssal Feeders. And I mean it this time, this is the last line of defense. Rocky, who was taken by the organization, is freed by the twin trainees. Elsewhere, the North group defends Rabona from awakened beings, and it is revealed that Priscilla, the destroyer creature, and Claire are stuck in this big fused mound of flesh. Yet again, I don't know what the hell to call this thing. Flesh mound. Let's, let's, let's go with flesh mound. With the organization's numbers depleted, Day, a f***ed up looking organization scientist, revives and releases the three strongest warriors in history. Excluding Teresa, of course. <laughs> Okay, they got nothing else after this, I promise. Anyways, Day uses Priscilla's arm to resurrect the three. The same arm that Priscilla jammed into Rocky to save him from the destroyer spike. Yeah, that's how OP Priscilla is in this manga. Her severed arm which she can grow back has that much effect on the story. A battle ensues between the following. Media leading the new Claymore versus the three number ones who end up awakening. Asteria the Elegant, Cassandra the Dust Eater, and Roxanne of Love and Hate. The North group arrives to help and the last number one standing, Cassandra, ends up eating Roxanne and heading towards Rabona, drawn by the presence of the Flesh Mound. After the battle, Media beheads Limp, marking the end of the organization. That is, until the organization's secret weapon Super Cyber Monkey Awakened Beings come and start destroying- Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. The North group arrives in Rabona to save Claire before Cassandra meets the Flesh Mound. Rocky calls out to Claire who emerges from the Flesh Mound. And yes, finally the two reunite after seven years. Oh, and we also get to see what claimers look like naked. It's not good. Basically, a claimer's body remains split open despite their healing abilities. So the organization just sews them up haphazardly. Deneva and Yuma do these honors. Priscilla then emerges from the mass and starts murking people as usual, and the North group prepares for the final battle. Volumes 24 through 27 initiate the final battle, bringing Claymore to a conclusion. The first phase of the final battle involves Cassandra versus the North group and the remaining strongest awakened beings on the island. Super Zombie Riffle vs Priscilla. And lastly in Rabona we have Galatea, Clarice, and the next generation Claymore vs a former warrior awakened being named Europa the Lazy, who kind of looks like that one boss in Star Fox 64. Anyways, Galatea and the new Claymore manage to defend Rabona from Europa, but at the cost of Clarice's life. Priscilla ends up defeating Super Riffle and kills Day after he tells her the truth behind her past. 
Unable to defeat Cassandra, the North group faces off with Priscilla in hopes of getting Cassandra to fight her. Rocky is wounded by Priscilla and phase two of the battle commences, involving the following parties. Priscilla vs. Everyone The battle wages on until Rocky and Claire deliver a critical blow. Yes, I said Rocky. He's actually useful in the final battle. Tabitha is killed by Priscilla, which marks the first and only death of the North group. Claire realizes that she must awaken the one within her, which turns out to be Teresa. The strongest Claymore in history has entered the chat and has taken control of Claire's body. Teresa clears house and kills Priscilla using her awakened form, which is basically her with wings. I guess she just drank some Red Bull. She bids farewell to everyone and Claire regains control of her body. Rubel is allowed to leave the island, but only after a stern warning from the twin trainees issued by Media. Media vows to destroy all the Yoma and awakened beings on the island. Claymore ends with Rocky and Claire going to see Quicksword Elena who was not killed by Raffaella after all. And that's the manga story. Now keep in mind this was a truncated summary of the manga. If I covered everything this video would be over an hour. But I'm sure you could tell that the manga adds a crap ton more to the story. Secrets are revealed, enemies are dispatched, and Claire releasing Teresa to defeat Priscilla is a cool full circle moment that's set up well throughout the manga. Claire. She becomes a more diverse character than her anime counterpart. After the time skip, her main goal is to find Rocky, but she does not forget her hatred of Priscilla. Remember kids, revenge is good. Upon finding Priscilla for the first time in the manga, she is unable to awaken due to a psychological block from Jean's sacrifice, despite being more than willing to abandon her humanity to defeat Priscilla. Skill-wise, she is a beast post time skip. She adapts Flora's wind cutter since it does not release Yoki unlike the quicksword technique and gets Raffaella's super senses after merging with the flesh mount. And if we factor in being able to release Teresa, she is the strongest claimer at the end of the manga. Speaking of Teresa, we get more information on her past through the side chapters. And if you're anything like me, you wondered if Teresa being used to create Claire would have any effect on the story. Well, it turns out it does, as she was inside Claire all along. This would explain why Priscilla was attracted to Claire. So the anime ending got that right, actually. Skill-wise, we see even more of her power and talent. She moves like Media does when using her phantom technique and easily copies Cassandra's devastating Dust Eater technique. She is likely stronger in this new form due to her being born from Claire's emotions. So yeah, she is still the strongest Claymore. Rocky. After the time skip, Rocky gets jacked and is a very capable fighter who is able to kill Yoma. He becomes much more useful than his anime self. He leads the trainees against the organization's men and helps Claire escape the Mound of Flesh. He also deals a critical blow to Priscilla. So yeah, instead of crying during the final battle, he's kicking ass. Priscilla. She's f***ing overpowered. But there is a reason for this. Her power is revealed to be linked to her hatred and her emotional state, which is why at times she appears weak and feeble. In chapter 136, Day reveals that a warrior's hatred and disgust for oneself are catalysts for their inhuman and twisted strength. Priscilla's past of having to kill her father turned Yoma and then having to eat him to survive created a disgust and hatred within her that birthed a strong claymore and an even stronger awakened being. Since her power is only limited by her hatred, she is basically a god. In chapters 143 and 144, we learn that she cast a curse upon herself to not see young girls in order to protect the future Claymore that would one day slay her. Ironically, we see this when she first awakens and ignores Claire, who was the person she was hoping for all along. So yeah, there is a reason Priscilla ignored Claire there. And all this points to Priscilla's human side desperately wanting to die, which is why she chased after Claire and Teresa's sin. She knew that they were the only ones that could slay her. Oh, and this was also why she was attracted to Rocky. She could smell Claire and Teresa's sin on him. So yeah, she's quite honestly the deepest character in the manga, and this is just a quick summary, which makes the anime version very disappointing. The Asunder Group Media achieves her goal of destroying the organization and seems to become the unquestioned leader of all the Claymores. Deneva is much more of a second in command than in the anime. She leads the North Group when Media is thought to be dead and is the master of pep talks. Helen learns Jean's drill sword technique and uses it with her extending limbs, which is pretty cool, and she is still the most human Claymore by far. The organization, let's start with Rubel, the handler of Claire and Raffaella and a spy for the side opposing the organization. He successfully hides all the information regarding semi-awakened beings. He attempts to set the Asunder group up multiple times behind the scenes and fails. But I guess he achieves his goal of destroying the organization from the inside. The sneaky bastard is allowed to leave the island by Media's orders, but only to relay the message that nothing remains on the island. Day, a manga-only character. He is a mad scientist and member of the retrieval squad. 
He has a very vast knowledge of all the Claymore ever made and tells Priscilla about her past. He dies joyfully being crushed by Priscilla's foot. Truly a weird character. Limped aka Ramuto, the leader of the organization. Before he's beheaded by media, he reveals the name of the dragon descendants, Asirakamu, and then explains the process of how Yoma are created, which ties in nicely to our next segment, How to Make a Yoma. How to make a Yoma? 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 How First how take flash from a fully awakened Asirakamu, then combine with flesh from its original form, which is twice the size of a human and could live up to 200 years. Note, it is best to make sure specimens are bonded and barely alive. You don't want them dead though, as rapid decomposition is a serious problem with this species. Lastly, take the squirming product and let it feed on a human brain, and the result is a Yoma. Be careful boys and girls, Yoma are very dangerous creatures, and should be kept within the appointed testing grounds. Oh, I never mentioned this to any Claymore. The themes of companionship and trauma are elaborated on in the manga. In chapter 138, we learn that the Asunder group all received Yoma flesh of someone close to them, and this explains why the Asunder group can come back after surpassing their limits. Day states it could be the will of the loved ones preventing them from awakening and losing their humanity. The Asunder group's companionship and bonds while human ultimately saved them from the desolate fate of all Claymore. We see this in action when Claire awakens and transforms into Teresa, whose flesh was inside her the whole time. Yagi reveals the strongest Claymore form as compassion and a deep reverence for the fallen. I don't think the organization would have ever gotten to that conclusion. As stated earlier, a Claymore's type is determined by how they reacted to a traumatic event. The manga adds to this by revealing that a Claymore's strength and potential is determined by how traumatic the experience was, and how much hatred they have for Yoma as a result. Priscilla is the strongest abyssal creature, with the greatest potential as a Claymore, only because she had the darkest past of them all. How could you not love how Yagi manages to bring all of this full circle in the manga? Now here's a list of 10 differences between manga and anime. The first three chapters in the manga are quite different than in the anime. In the manga before Claire arrives in Rocky's village, Rocky's brother Zaki tells him more about the Claymore, including that they take Yoma flesh in their body and that all male Claymores died a horrible death. In the anime, Zaki only tells Rocky that Claymore are half human and half Yoma. We don't learn about the flesh part until episode 2, and we don't learn about male awakened beings until episode 10. The real issue was that every last one of the males reached the limit far too quickly. You see, awakening is very similar to sexual pleasure. Now see, that's not realistic at all, and as a man, I feel attacked. In the manga, Claire leaves the village after saving Rocky. Claire then goes on two missions by herself, one in which she slays a Yoma disguised as a village chief, and the second in which she slays five Yoma in an empty village. In the anime, Rocky immediately starts traveling with Claire, and during episode 2, we see the end of the second mission, where Claire slays two Yoma and throws her claymore at the last one fleeing. There is no fake chief mission. In the manga during chapter 3, Claire randomly finds Rocky in the desert and saves him. I would say this doesn't make sense since Claire had already been in two different villages, so the odds of her running into Rocky would be very unlikely. Also during this scene there is no flashback on why the villagers kicked out Rocky. In the anime this scene takes place during the second half of episode 1. Claire leaves but Rocky appears to follow her trail and we see a flashback of the villagers kicking him out. Claire battles the fake Claymore just like in the manga. Anime did it better on this one. But at least manga Rocky was prepared for the weather. In the manga the events leading up to Elena's death in chapter 4 as followed. Claire explains to Rocky that the hilt of a claymore contains the black card that is to be sent to another claymore upon the sender's awakening. And she actually shows him where it's hidden, which is pretty cool. Claire then goes into detail about how all claymore eventually turn into Yoma. Overall, the scene occurs in one chapter and is pretty fast. In the anime during episode 2, we get some cool micro flashbacks with Elena and Claire. However, Claire doesn't tell Rocky anything and leaves him in a village. Instead, Rubo explains to Rocky the same details, which causes Rocky to worry and follow Claire. Claire then gives some details to Rocky. This whole scene takes an episode to happen. In the manga, when Claire and Rocky leave Rabona, Sid kisses Claire. Rocky obviously isn't too happy about this, so he delivers a nutshell that doesn't seem to affect Sid's iron sack. We do not see Rocky get a sword from Gulk, yet he ends up having one later. In the anime, Sid does not kiss Claire, but Gulk gives Rocky his sword before the two depart. During chapter 31 of the manga, before the first encounter with Ophelia, Claire enters Ganal with Rocky and thinks over how she intended on leaving Rocky in a nearby village, but none were suitable. In the anime, Claire does leave Rocky at a nearby village, but he follows her and intervenes when Claire is being held by Ophelia, just like in the manga. 
In the manga, Ophelia and Claire's first one-on-one -on -one is a little different. Ophelia goes into more detail about offensive and defensive type Claymore, and Claire sets a desperate tree trap for Ophelia, which fails. In the anime, Ophelia does go over offensive and defensive types, but in less detail. The trap panels are cut, and the scene is much shorter. In the manga, Muscular Sophie and Stormwind Noel are the two claymores along with Quicksword Elena and Priscilla that go after Teresa. In the anime, their full names are never mentioned for some reason. In the manga, when Riffle tells Claire, Galatea, and Jean about Isley, she goes into detail about how a new creature destroys villages and kills everyone but young girls. From this detail, Claire realizes Riffle is talking about Priscilla. In the anime, Riffle just mentions that the female awakened being has one horn, and this is enough for Claire to realize that Riffle is talking about Priscilla. In the manga during chapter 55, Flora actually gets her wish to spar with Claire. Afterwards, Flora gives up her title as the fastest, although the two are equal in strength. In the anime, Jean cockboxes epic showdown between fast swords. I guess they didn't have any room in the budget for a battle here. Lame. And here's a bonus. After the battle with Riffle, Galatea spares Claire and Jean. The anime ends the scene here, but the manga continues to show an organization member asking a figure if she can defeat Riffle. The figure is number one ranked Alicia, and the member states that she will be the strongest Claymore in history. Maybe the showrunners knew there wasn't going to be a second season if they took this scene out. Oh, and I think we all know by now that she was not the strongest. Stop the cow! The manga takes length in pacing. Although both works are paced well, the anime shorted the series, giving the manga the advantage here. The manga also takes story since the anime ran out of content and left the story unfinished. The character slash themes category is not close either. Claymore is defined by the Claymore, and the manga successfully adds new ones while flushing out the original cast. And lastly, we have presentation. The anime does a great job here, but the manga's added detail with Awakened Beings is amazing, which gives it a slight edge here. So we have a clean sweep here, guys. Read the manga, read the manga, read the manga. Yeah, but there's definitely more to consider here. The manga is objectively better, but I started with the anime. The anime is really good. I own the anime. You should watch the anime. So what I would suggest doing is stopping the anime right around episode 23 and then continuing the manga on from chapter 59. There's not much you miss in those first 59 chapters. So starting from there is a pretty good jumping point from the anime and you get to bypass that weak ass ending in the anime. So my final verdict on this is continue on meaning watch the anime and then continue reading the manga to complete the story. Lastly, let's take a look at what the people think. Yeah, that's right. We actually have a poll this time around. We're moving up in the world. I asked Claymore subreddit, manga or anime? And here are the results. Looks like 68% of fans say read the manga. Can't really argue with that. They're probably right. 27% say anime then manga, like me, leaving a mere 5% that say just watch the anime. As always, let me know where you guys stand on this debate in the comments section below. And I just want to give a special thanks for everyone that participated in that poll. Your answers were great and they helped me make this video, so I really appreciate it. My personal goal here, guys, is to get to 1,000 subscribers here pretty soon. Thank you for the 500, man. It means a lot. I read all the comments and respond. So if you guys watch the videos, you don't comment, you're just maybe just watching and trying to learn about some manga or anime and what you should do and how you should watch it. Subscribe, there's going to be a lot more content coming up here pretty soon. Uh, lend me your energy. Let's get to a thousand together. Join the Breaking Tropes family. I promise there's something in it for you at some point if you like anime or manga. In the meantime, subscribe, like, and talk that sweet sh**. Next video heat. A poll. Oh, that's a pretty good one.